I uh, moved the computer a little bit over this week because the last few weeks, the cross, the sun shines through it, and then you can't even see my head. So it was looking kind of funny, so I think I probably should move it over. People might get the wrong idea. Mm. But uh, it's good to be here this morning, and I'm glad to see everybody here this morning. And just been it's been a good week this week. And uh, last week we talked about how you know there's people in need. You know we need to be faithful with what God has given us and to help people who are in need. And maybe God is calling us to be given a little more. Give a little more than we have, maybe. And so I want to encourage you to give. And also want to encourage you to give in a way that kind of advances the gospel. Where, you know, we want to meet physical needs, but the most important thing is getting the gospel to people as well. And so there's a lot of great things, you know, you could give to if you felt led to. Like there's the Gideons. The Samaritan's Purse, many things that help get the gospel to people. But don't overlook the community as well. And what's going on here in our community. Where there's needs in the community we can meet as well. And so just want us to really be thinking about that as well. And this week, there has really been something on my mind and on my heart this week. And... Is two words that have kept coming back to my mind all week. And throughout the gospel, Jesus says it to someone 23 times. He tells them this 23 times. Throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's recorded 23 times. And so if he said it 23 times, it must be pretty important. And he said, this is what he said. He said, follow me. Jesus said, follow me. First he called his disciples. He said, come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Then later on, he told people, he said, uh, deny yourself. If you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Follow me. Then he later on, he said, if you don't take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. And then in the last chapter of John's gospel, he tells Peter, he tells them, hey, this is how you're going to die, but you follow me. You follow me. And then Peter did probably what most of us would do. Hey, what about them? What about them? She says, don't worry about them. You must follow me. And so there's many times that Jesus kept telling people, follow me. He went to tax collectors said, follow me. The rich man that we looked at last week, he said, you know, sell your possessions. You'll have treasures in heaven and then come and follow me. He said, follow me, follow me, follow me. And Jesus is calling us today to, to follow him. He's still calling us today, follow me. But in many ways, I feel like we've lost what it means to follow Jesus. What does it mean to really follow Jesus? And in some ways, have we really counted the cost of what it means to follow Jesus? We really know what it means to follow Jesus. Where Jesus says, you die to yourself. You deny yourself. You take up your cross and you follow me. Where he's saying, look, if you follow me, people are not going to like you. People are going to hate you. You're going to be hated. You're going to be persecuted. But follow me. Let's give up everything. It's going to be okay. As long as you follow me, you'll have treasures in heaven. And told that rich man, he said, you sell everything. You have treasures in heaven. The stuff here on the earth is not as important. Jesus was telling him, hey, you're too consumed with your stuff. You're more of enslaved with your stuff. You care more about your stuff. If you just get rid of it, don't let it hold on to you. And follow me and you'll have treasures in heaven. And he tells people, he says, follow me even if it leads to death. And you'll have this great reward. You'll have a reward in heaven. Where he says, those who lose their life for my sake will find it. And then Paul even tells us to live is Christ and to die is gain. But do we really live as though dying is gain? And we're all faced with that question of 
do we really believe that the that the reward that we find in Jesus is worth it? Worth giving it all for? To follow him. And so today we're going to look at a passage in Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus calls Matthew a tax collector. He calls him, he says, come follow me. And Matthew got up and went and followed him. He left what he had and went and followed him. And so last week we saw the rich man who Jesus said, sell your stuff, follow me. And he couldn't do it. It's, he loved his stuff too much. He wasn't willing to pay the price of what it cost to follow Jesus. But here, Matthew, another rich man, was a tax collector. He was rich. But he was willing to give it all to follow Jesus. And so Jesus calls him. And then at the end of chapter 9, this is what Jesus says in verse 35. Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and, and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest fields. So here we have Jesus. He's going throughout these towns and villages. He's seeing these people. He's telling them about the kingdom of God, healing their sick. And he looks at them and he has compassion on them because they were lost. They were like a sheep without a shepherd. And so Jesus turns to his disciples and says, the harvest is plentiful. Don't you see all these lost people? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So he tells them, pray and ask God that he would send out workers into his harvest fields. And we can read this and think, that's like, it's, that's today too. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are very few. But those who are going and doing these work and where there are billions of people in the world who are lost. Or they're without a shepherd. They're in need of Jesus. The harvest is still plentiful. But the workers are still few. And so in many ways we need to pray that the Lord would send out workers into his harvest fields. And the disciples were probably thinking, okay, yeah, we need to pray. Because someone needs to do something about this. So we need to pray that God would raise up people to go and do his work. And they might have been thinking, you know, I know someone who might be good at this. I'm going to pray that God would work on their heart and he would send them out to do something. But then in the next chapter, in chapter 10, this is what happens. In chapter 10, Jesus sends his disciples out into this field. So he told them, pray because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. What they didn't realize is they were praying for themselves because Jesus was going to send them out to the harvest and to the fields. He sent them out into the fields, his disciples. And so the disciples didn't realize that that's what they were praying for. They were praying for themselves that Jesus was about to send them out to these people. Sometimes we don't think like that. We don't think, hey, God wants to send me. God wants to use me. But in many ways he does. He wants to send us out into these fields. And so Jesus tells them in chapter 10, he says, I'm sending you out to proclaim the gospel. So I'm going to give you power to drive out demons, to heal those who are sick and diseased. And so Jesus sends them out. And this is what it says in Matthew 10, verse 6. It says, Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel, and you will go proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So Jesus tells him, go heal the sick. Go, I'm sending you out to these people. Heal their sick. Tell them about the kingdom of God. Tell them the kingdom has come near. And I imagine that the disciples were probably excited about this. They've been walking with Jesus. They saw Jesus heal the sick. 
and perform these miracles. And they're probably really excited to go out and do this and tell people about the gospel. But then what Jesus says next probably made them question a little bit. Where and after this in verse 16, before in the middle of that, he tells them, he says, look, don't take anything with you. If you have a purse, leave it. Don't take no money, don't take anything. It's going to be provided for you. Don't take anything with you. Then in verse 16, he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they have arrested you, do not worry about what to say or how you will say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it is for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and father his child. Children will, will, will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going throughout the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above his teacher, nor the servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like their teacher and the servant to be like their master. If the head of the house is called Beelzebub, how much more will the members of his household? And so Jesus he tells them here, he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. And if you think about that, think about what Jesus was saying, the sheep among wolves, where sheep are probably one of the most helpless animals, really. They're, they have like no defense mechanism at all. All they can do is run, and they run really slow. And so one of the worst things for a sheep to do would be to wander into a pack of wolves. But Jesus here is telling them, send you out among these wolves, like sheep among these wolves. And so when we think about that, that begs the question. If Jesus is called the good shepherd. In Hebrews, he's called the great shepherd. Then why would he tell them that he's sending his sheep out among these wolves? Where Jesus tells his disciples, I'm sending you to some very dangerous places that you're going to go to. But I'm sending you to this great danger. And... We don't think like that, like Jesus would send us to danger. We think, we say things like the safest place to be would be in God's will. We say things like, if it's dangerous, then God must not be in it. If it's dangerous, if it's risky, if it costs something, if it's unsafe, that can't be God's will. To follow Jesus, that means you're in the safest place where it doesn't cost anything. To follow Jesus, but that's not always true. Because Jesus here tells them, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. In many, many cases, the most dangerous place for us to be, physically, not spiritually, is be in God's will when he sends us to these dangerous places. It's the best place for us to be spiritually, but physically, it can be very dangerous. Where he tells them, I'm sending you out. You're going to be flogged, you're going to be beaten, be persecuted. But he tells them, you know, people, brother will betray brother to death. But I'm sending you out there. Stand firm. You're going to be hated because of me, but stand firm and you'll be saved. Then at the end he says, don't you know that a student is not above his teacher? They hated me, they're going to hate you. If they beat me, they're going to beat you. But you follow me in this. You follow me. Then in verse 28, he continues. And he says, do not be afraid. Of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. 
Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And so Jesus here, he tells them, he says, don't be afraid of those that can kill the body but can't kill the soul. So I'm sending you out among these wolves. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be beaten. You're going to be flogged. You're going to be hated. But don't, don't be afraid of them. Be more afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And he says, don't you know that you're worth more than sparrows? And no sparrow falls to the ground outside of your father's will, outside of his care. And you're worth more than many sparrows. And then at the very end of this, he tells them in verse 38. He says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. So Jesus tells them, I'm sending you out. This whole chapter is about Jesus sending out the twelve. He says, I'm sending you out. Like sheep among these wolves. You're going to go to some very dangerous places. You're going to be hated. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be beaten. Maybe even killed. But stand firm because the one who stands firm will be saved. I told you that they hated me. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. But stand firm. Because if you don't take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. What he says. And he says, whoever would find their life will lose it in the end. Whoever loses their life for my sake, in the end they will find it. And I read this, and I think that Jesus was hated. People are going to hate me. Jesus was persecuted. I'll probably persecuted. There may come a time where Jesus was beaten. He died on a cross. They might do the same to me. So I'll follow him. And if you love your life, you'll lose it. And I look at the church today and it seems like we've lost this idea of what it really means to follow Jesus. What it truly means to follow Jesus. It's almost like we've changed what it means to follow Jesus. Or we've made following Jesus to be, well, just come sit in church. It'll be fine. We've twisted it where it's like we twisted to say, well, following Jesus means you're in the most safest place possible. The most comfortable place you can be in. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And the worst part is that in many ways we've turned following Jesus, we've made it look a lot like the American dream. The American dream of have all these stuff. We've made following Christ like that. Or we look at our lives and it's more like we're trying to find it here on the earth than we're really trying to lose it for the sake of the gospel. And many of us has probably found a life here on the earth. We found our life here. And the more and more that I read the Bible, the more and more I see that following Jesus is going to cost something. And the more I see that this world is not our home. That we're living for another world. We're living for heaven to come. Where Jesus says, whoever finds his life will, will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And Paul understood that. That's why Paul said to die, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That is gain. But do we actually live as though to die is gain? No, we don't. We don't. We love our lives here. I love my life here. We love our lives here on the earth. We don't really live as though to die is gain. And in many ways, the church has started chasing after worldly things and stopped chasing after Christ. And I really believe that God is calling his church to come back to him, to truly follow him. And in many ways, he's going to do whatever it takes to get the church's attention. Maybe that's why we got the coronavirus. We don't listen to that. Guess what? He'll send something else. Have to wake up and listen to what he's saying. 
To live is Christ and to die is gain. To live as though dying really was gain. To die was a reward. Where Jesus calls us to deny ourselves. And yet instead of doing that, we tend to indulge ourselves in luxuries. Indulge ourselves in these things where we've become so comfortable that we've forgotten what it means to follow Jesus. We've forgotten what it means to truly be following him. And we've lost sight of a mission that we're on to reach the lost people. Where would you really be willing to follow Jesus to death? To follow him to death where it's going to cost something. To maybe give up the life you're living now. It's going to cost something. To follow him. In John chapter 21. Jesus has this conversation with Peter. In the last chapter of John's gospel. He has this conversation with Peter. This is after he's done died on the cross. Rose again on the third day. And it's right before he's going to ascend into heaven. And so the, la the, the last thing he says to Peter is also the first thing that he says to Peter. The first thing Jesus called him, he said, follow me. The last thing he says to Peter, again he tells him, follow me. And so in John 21, Peter and Jesus have this conversation. Where Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter goes, yes, I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. Jesus asked him that three times, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than anything else? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. You know all things. You know I love you. And Jesus tells him, feed my sheep. And then he says this to Peter in verse 18. He says, very truly I tell you, when you were young, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who leaned back against Jesus at the at the supper and has said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. So Jesus and Peter have this conversation where he goes, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, Lord, you know I love you more than these. You know I love you more than anything else. And then Jesus told him, he said, okay, this is how you're going to die. But follow me. If you follow me, this is how you're going to die. When Jesus told him, he said, oh, you need to follow me. I want you to go and feed my sheep. But when you do that, it's going to cost you your life. You're going to die. You're going to be crucified. You saw me earlier hanging on the cross. That's what's coming for you. But follow me. Remember I told you a student is not above his teacher. They hated me. They crucified me. They're going to do the same to you. But you follow me. They hated me. But you follow me. They're going to hate you. But you follow me. And Peter did what most of us probably would have done too. Well, Jesus, what about them? You told me I was going to die. What about them? Am I the only one that's going to have to die for this? Or are they going to have to die too? Like, is it just me that's going to have to die for this? And the rest of everybody else gets to live? Or is it just, just me? Jesus, tell me, what about them? And Jesus answered him, if I want them to remain alive, what is that to you? You don't worry about that. You must follow me. And Jesus tells him, don't worry about them. You be concerned about you and following me. I've given you your, your task. They have their own task. You follow me. I could think Peter go, yeah, but, but what about them? Well, I just need to know. Are they going to have to die or is it just me? And Jesus just tells him, don't worry about it. You follow me. And so at this point, Jesus had a choice to make. Peter had a choice to make. He had a choice to make here what Jesus said. 
Whereas, are you really going to follow me if it means that you're going to die? He had a choice to make, and Peter could have either followed Jesus and died. He could have turned and ran the other way and not done it. Or he could have done what I feel many people in the church do. He could have said, yes, I'll follow you, and then live his life the most comfortable and most safest way possible. It's like, yeah, I'll follow you. I'll pretend to follow Jesus where I can pretend and it won't cost me my life. Peter could have done that. And really, if he did that, would people have known the difference? If he was truly following Jesus or not? Back then, yeah, they would have known that he wasn't really following Jesus. But today, we can do it and fool people. And people may not even know. And the bad part is if Peter would have said, no, I like, I want my life. It's worth more to me. My life is worth more to me than following you, Jesus. I don't want to be crucified. If he did that, then what would have happened to the spread of the gospel to people? Or if he wanted his life, but he didn't do that. He followed Jesus to death. He followed him to the death. And what was the result of Peter following Jesus to the death, to his death? The result was that the gospel spread to many people. Many people came to know Christ through what Peter did. And if it weren't for Peter, if it weren't for Paul, all these other disciples that risked everything for it, we might not be here. We might not be able to come and worship Jesus. We would be these lost people heading for eternity without God. If it wasn't for someone else's sacrifice. So Jesus told Peter that, he said that he told Peter this, and he told Peter to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. We don't think like that. Like he said, this, you, Peter, you're going to die, and by you dying, it's going to glorify God. We don't think like that. We think death is bad. But he says, through your death, it's going to bring glory to God. Or when you die, is gain. That death is a reward. It's going to bring glory to God. And just imagine, because Peter did follow him to death. He was crucified on a cross upside down because he didn't feel like he was worthy enough to die in the same way Jesus did. And I can imagine Peter dying on the cross. He gets crucified. He dies. Then the next thing he sees is Jesus saying, Well done. Good and faithful servant. Come and enjoy these riches. It was worth it. You didn't withhold anything from me. You picked up your cross and you followed me to death. And now you're going to enjoy the reward here for you. And the other disciples as well also followed Jesus to their death. Where Peter was crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified in Greece. James was beheaded. But yet they all believed that it was worth the cost. They all believed it was worth the cost of following Jesus. Where they found something worth losing their life for. Where they lived as though dying was gain. As though they lived as though what Jesus said was true. They really believed that what he said was true. That those who lose their life for his sake will find it. They lived as denying themselves and to pick up their cross and follow him. For they were willing to lose their lives in order to know Jesus, to follow him and proclaim the gospel. Where their lives, they live lives that follow Jesus and they walk down this path of following Jesus and they gave everything for it. And now I think here we are some 2,000 years later. And I wonder how far we have wandered away from that path that they were on, of giving it all. Where somehow, along the way, we've kind of abandoned. We've limited what it really means to follow Jesus, where it's like he didn't really mean give it all. Abandon it all to follow him. And now we have churches that are full with Christians that are just content with just being associated with Jesus, instead of truly following him, instead of truly coming and being with him. And they live their lives for themselves. 
or following Jesus has been made as just good church attendance. They made of give give a little bit of your money, pray a prayer, instead of that denying yourself and following me, even if it means it leads to your death. And I think about those first believers who gave it all. But there was a lot of people in that early church that were martyred, that were killed for their faith. Stephen was stoned for his faith. But they all persevered. And because of what they did, now we can come and meet here. Where we don't have to worry and fear for our lives like they did. We can come here and meet freely, openly. And it's because of what someone else did. Someone else believed enough in Christ to get us to where we are today. To reach and get reach people. And uh, let me put it this way. We're lucky to live in America. We are. And so often we forget the reason why we can live here and be free. Live in the this land of freedom, where we have this freedom here. We forget why, we, why we're here and we have that. We forget about the men and women who gave their lives so that we could be free here in this country. Men and women who died for this country, who never got to see any of the stuff that we have today. Who never got to enjoy the freedoms that we have today. And in the same way, there are people that have come before us who were persecuted for their faith, who died for their faith, and even killed for their faith, so that we could come here and worship freely today. Where they gave it all to follow Jesus, even to the point of death, and now we're reaping the benefits of their sacrifice. Where, because of them, we now were able to, we were able to hear about the gospel because of their sacrifice. I heard this story the other day about there was a, a tribe in, uh, I think it's called Sumatra in Indonesia. And I heard a story of how Christ kind of came, how they learned to know about Christ here. And so there was this missionary couple that went to this village, this tribe. This is a very big tribe. And the tribe was 100% Muslim at the time. 100% of it was Muslim. And so the tribal leaders captured this missionary couple and they killed them and they cannibalized them. And then years later, another missionary came to this tribe. And again, they shared the gospel with these people. And the tribal leaders noticed that the story they had told was exactly the same as the former missionaries that had came before. And so this time they listened. And after they listened, they believed. And in a short time, the entire, tribe, the entire tribe was converted to Christianity, became followers of Jesus. And now today, there are more than three million Christians among that tribe in uh, northern Sumatra. And I read that story, and the first thing that I thought about when I read that story that came to my mind was, would I be willing to be that first missionary couple, the one who died who was killed and was cannibalized so that those that would come after me could lead people to Christ. And I want us to think about that today because what we do today affects the generation that comes behind us. And if they don't see us following Jesus, denying ourselves, pick up your cross, following Jesus, then they won't do it either. And the ones that come after that won't do it either. I mean, in many ways, that's kind of how we got to where we are today. Because people stopped following Jesus like the Bible tells us to. And then sometimes we wonder why the next generation isn't following Jesus. In many ways, maybe it's because they never saw us do it. They never saw me live my life as though I was living for Jesus. They didn't see it in us. In many ways, all they saw was good church attendance, good people who didn't uh, didn't cuss, but they also saw they neglected the poor. They lived in luxury. They didn't truly follow it out. They didn't live like Christ. 
They didn't live as though dying was gain. And there's one last story that I want, I want to leave us with. It's a guy by the name of Jim Elliott, who was a missionary who went to this tribe in India. And this tribe was really known for killing outsiders. Anyone who would come, they would just kill them. It wasn't, you know, Christians, whatever it is. Anyone, any outsider that would come, this tribe was known for, for killing them. That would come. And many people in his church tried to talk him out of going. They said, it's too risky. Don't go. You're going to die. It's too risky. Don't go. And this is what he said. He said, consider the call from the throne above. Go ye, and from around, oh, and and around about, come over and help us. And even the call from the souls in hell below, send Lazarus to my brother, that they may come to this place. Impelled by these voices, I dare not stay home while people in this tribe in India perish. So what if the well-fed church in the homeland needs stirring? They have the scriptures and Moses and the prophets and a whole lot more. Their condemnation is written on their bank books and the dust on their Bibles. American believers have sold their lives to the service of wealth and riches. And God has his rightful way of dealing with those who succumb to the spirit of Laodicea. What Elliot said when the people told him and tried to talk him out of going. And so he went. And it wasn't long after he went that him and four other men came and met this tribe. They were met with spears and they died. And so when we think about that, we think, well, should have should Elliot have listened to the people who tried to talk him out of it? Because in the days to come after his death, his wife Elizabeth would lead the very men who killed her husband to Christ. And now many in that region have come to know Christ. So I see these stories about this missionary couple who went and died, and Jim Elliot, who they saw death as reward, where they saw it as to live as Christ and to die as gain, to follow Jesus even to death. And now they're comforted and they have that reward for the way they live their lives. And so we're all faced with the question is, would that be me? Would I be willing to do that? Would I be willing to die for my faith, willing to die to follow Jesus in order that those who come after me may come to know Jesus, come to know the Lord? Would I be willing to die for Christ? Or are we willing to live as though dying is gain? Or to following Jesus, will we obey the call? Because he's still calling us to follow him. Do we really believe that what Jesus said is true? About those who lose their life will find it for his sake. That they'll find it. Do we really believe that? Have we counted the cost of what it really takes to truly follow Jesus? Or we can no longer sit in this comfortability, but we have to do something about it. Because there's people in our community that are perishing apart from God. We're sitting doing nothing about it. And in many ways, is God really pleased with the way that we're following him? What we're doing, is he pleased with it? Because the world needs the church to wake up and start being true followers of Jesus. To truly follow with him. And today, Jesus is still calling us the same, follow me. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. And there'll be a great reward in heaven to die as gain. But are we willing to follow him even to death? That's a question that we all have to face. And here in America, we don't have that persecution like other countries do. But for them, if they're a Christian, it could truly mean their life. For us, if we're a Christian, it doesn't necessarily mean our life. But there may come a day where we're really going to be faced with this question. Are you going to follow Jesus to death? 
What if persecution really comes here? He's still going to follow me. Still going to follow him even to death. Even to death on a cross. There are many believers that came before us who truly believed this and lived it out. Where they gave everything for this. And a lot of times, I think sometimes we've simplified it in as that's more radical. It's radical for people to live that way. But everything I read in the Bible seems to say that that's normal. Sometimes we limit, limit it even more. Well, that's just for pastors. That's just for missionaries. No, it's for all of us. Jesus has called all of us. And I tell you all this because I love you all. And I don't want you to miss out on this. Because yes, this is a call to die for the name of Jesus, but it's also a call to live that we miss out on. We think so much in the natural world, but to live is in the spiritual world. One day we're not going to be here. And we're going to live for the kingdom to come. And while we're here, there's a mission, there's a work for us to do. All of us, our work is different. But God has still called us to follow him. But are we really willing to truly follow him in this way? And so let us pray. <laughs> Lord, we want to thank you for just letting us be able to come here and worship you freely in this building. Lord, we thank you for what you've done in our lives. And Lord, we're all faced with a choice here where we are really going to truly live out our faith and follow you. Or are we going to just halfway do it? Lord, open our hearts up. Help us to receive your word and help us to get that, that to die is gain. That this world is not our home. That we need to be more concerned of storing up the treasures in heaven than storing up treasures here on the earth. Lord, open our hearts up to you and send your spirit to move and convict us. Lord, help us to just give it all to you, surrender it all to you, whatever it may be. Lord, we want to follow you. We want to be true followers of Jesus. Where, Lord, we live out what you say. And we follow you. And we deny ourselves every day. Whether it be pleasures of this world, whatever it is, Lord, we deny ourselves. And we just give it to you. We pick up our cross and we follow you. We believe that you're worth it. You're worth dying for. And though we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.